Hey, it's Jeff with Master Medics here. Thank you so much for checking out our channel and our videos. Today we're talking about the pathophysiology of preeclampsia and eclampsia. So hopefully you're excited for this video and understanding this, uh, this obstetrical emergency a little bit better so you can treat your patients better. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button so that way you get the chance to see all of our new videos as they come out because we send a, put out a lot of videos. So hopefully you're excited for that as well. Let's get into it. As you can probably see, this is a um, basically a baby. This is a pregnant belly, and uh, the reason that I chose this picture is because uh, preeclampsia does not happen in a um, does not happen in early pregnancy. It doesn't happen in the first trimester. It doesn't happen in the second trimester. It happens in the third trimester or sometimes 48 hours postpartum as well, up to 10 days postpartum as well. So those are the times that we're typically seeing that. And the case that I put out on Friday, which we're gonna go through in just a sec here, uh, they, that was a postpartum eclampsia that was occurring. And that's those are the two main times that it can occur, third trimester and postpartum postpartum and so those kind of big things that we're gonna look for okay and so why does this occur well let's talk about what we think is occurring okay and so we have our placenta obviously the cord is kind of over here but I'm gonna put the placenta up on this side just so it's a little bit easier to see okay so a few different things in the anatomy here we have the placenta okay we have a couple little particular areas like so. And the reason I'm drawing them out like that is because we need to understand there's two separate layers here. Okay, we have the myometrium, okay. Okay, the myometrium here, and then we also have the endometrium. Okay, I'll put that in purple, so that should be easiest to see. Okay, the endo metrium okay those are the two layers of placenta itself in order to basically kind of have that barrier for the baby okay and after those two particular areas we have the placenta then we have a bunch of kind of channels of vessels okay so I'm gonna put that in let's put it in uh, kind of a, a black just so we can really see it okay these vessels essentially come through like so okay and they come off Okay, like this, okay? And these guys are called your spiral arteries. And your spiral arteries are what's gonna feed the baby itself, feed the, feed the embryo and get that nourishment that a particular needs. Those are what those spiral arteries are going to be for, okay? So those are the three big things that we need to know first off. Now, there is something that occurs that's quite interesting that we need in order to stimulate blood flow. Okay, so this baby, as it's growing, okay, as the embryo, embryonic stage gets bigger and bigger and bigger and longer and longer and longer, we have these particular things, okay, and I'm just gonna draw, if we had an embryo like so, we would have these little guys on the outside, like this, outside of the cell, like this, okay, like those. And what these guys are called, these guys are called trophoblasts. Okay, trophoblasts. And these trophoblasts have a very interesting role. In fact, they are vital in the growth of this embryo. So what they're going to do is these trophoblasts are going to penetrate this endometrium. Okay, they're gonna penetrate this endometrium and basically attach to these spiral arteries. And what's gonna happen is that when these trophoblasts attach to these spiral arteries, it's going to allow for these spiral arteries to grow and to thicken or enlarge, which makes sense because as this embryo gets bigger and bigger, as this baby gets bigger and bigger, we're gonna need more and more blood flow. Well, what's the best way to get more and more blood flow? To stimulate vessels to get bigger. And that's what those trophoblasts will do is they allow for these spiral arteries to get thicker. Okay, or wider, so that way we have an increase in blood flow. Okay, that is how we stimulate blood flow as this embryo gets larger and larger through the trophoblast penetrating the endometrium. Okay, so now that you know all these pieces that are kind of in play in order to grow this baby, how does it all fall apart? This is the normal process. How, where does it fall apart? Okay, well, where it falls apart is right here at the endometrium. 
Okay, we know the trophoblasts are trying to penetrate this endometrium wall in order to get into the spiral arteries and stimulate the width and the widening and the blood flow. But the problem is, is that when we have that occur, or in a what we think in a uh, an eclamptic situation or preeclampsia situation, is that these trophoblasts are unable to penetrate that endometrium. Okay, so it's unable to penetrate that endometrium or a smaller portion of them are going to be able to penetrate. So if we have less trophoblasts that are able to penetrate the endometrium, we're going to have a lack of blood flow. Okay, we're going to have a decrease in blood flow, which means that this embryo and this baby is going to have a harder time actually growing. Okay, and so if you make sense, if we go back to remember we said that this typically happens in the third trimester, well, it makes sense is that these trophoblasts, their whole purpose is to stimulate the spinal, spiral arteries to enlarge. If it's unable to do that, and we have a lack of blood flow because of the inability to penetrate the endometrium, it kind of makes sense that we would have some problems because this baby needs to grow. And without that blood flow, this baby is going to struggle, okay? And this is where that preeclampsia really comes into play, okay? When we have this decrease in blood flow, and when we have that decrease in blood flow into this particular area here in the placental area, this is going to cause irritation. Okay, it's going to cause an irritation. And from this irritation, it's going to release inflammatory cells and inflammatory responses and indicators. And what it's going to do is it's actually going to irritate smooth muscles, particularly endothelial cells within vessels. So if I was to do a cross section here of a vessel, okay, you have the external and then the lumen itself, you have these endothelial cells okay, within the muscle portions, the smooth muscle of these vessels. And what happens is that we have these immune cells, these, this irritation, this uh, inflammatory response due to the lack of blood flow to this placental area, it's going to irritate these endothelial cells. And the irritation of that endothelial cells is going to cause vasoconstriction. It's, cause, it's going to cause stimulus and irritation to those endothelial cells. It's going to stimulate contraction. Okay? And it stimulates contraction, so these vessels start to contract. Okay? they start to contract, okay, which gives us our increase in blood pressure, okay? So another thing that's gonna happen is that we're gonna cause a that vessel to become leaky. We have an immune response here. We do have a irritation of these endothelial cells, which is unusual for an inflammatory response, but we're seeing very specific cells from the placenta that are actually irritating these cells. So like oftentimes when we see sepsis will cause vasodilation because of that immune response, because of the specific targeting of these endothelial cells from the placental cells, we're seeing vasoconstriction, so an opposite effect that we typically would see. That being said, we're also going to have permeability problems, which means that these vessels are gonna to start to get leaky, okay? They're gonna to start to leak. And that's a very big problem as well because those vessels are going to leak and create edema. And that's a big problem as well. Then we're gonna have some changes in hydrostatic pressures as well because that increase in blood pressure is going to cause some flow problems. And so we're gonna have more edema there as well, which is why often in a preeclamptic situation, we typically see a lot of edema in the feet, the hands, and also the face as well when those things are occurring simply because of the permeability of these vessels and the vasoconstriction that changes the hydrostatic pressures within the capillary beds, okay? So a few big things are going on here in order to create our kind of big problem of the, the preeclampsia. So I'm gonna...